will be David Gayot from Perimeter. He will talk about sure quantization of complex John Simon theory. Okay. I would like to describe a somewhat peculiar quantization method, which seems to give good results for the definition of a John Simon theory with complex gauge group. So uh, the, I will start by just describing what I mean with quantization and uh, why we should be able to uh, find some nice examples of quantization using supersymmetric quantum field theory as a, as a catch. Uh, then I will discuss how this can be applied to character varieties, which, is the phase, which are the phase spaces of uh, uh, complex and simultaneous theory, and then to complex and simultaneous theory itself. And uh, I will end up with a small example, which is a uh, surprising duality between uh, some complex and some theory and the SYK model, double scale SYK model. So quantization. Uh, quantization, well, of course, is a pretty familiar notion. Uh, it's the idea of what well, a procedure to transfer, to, to take a classical system and try to produce a quantum system. Typically, you have some phase space and some Poisson algebra of uh, observables, say some classical functions on your phase space with a, with a complex conjugation. And the, and the Poisson bracket. And your goal is to produce a family of algebras, non-commutative algebras, which uh, deform the classical observables by the Poisson bracket and higher order terms. And uh, there are two aspects to this process. You both need both to define this algebra, but also to find representation of this algebra on some, a unitary representation of some Hilbert space. Um, this is not an algorithm. It's, a, it's an art. So it, it might or not work the way you want. Uh, sometimes you might not be able to produce a quantization with the properties you like. Sometimes there will be ambiguities. Um, in general, the, if you want to preserve some symmetries, for example, of your original system, this might pose some, some very severe constraints on the, on the procedure. Uh, you might want to quantize in families, and this might be also an important constraint. Um, something which occurs in quantization is also the possibility of producing states with, with given properties. Uh, in classical physics, uh, a state and initial condition is given by a Lagrangian submanifold in the phase space. And uh, once you have a Lagrangian submanifold, you have sort of, have some ob sort of X observables, which are functions on this Lagrangian submanifold and form a module for the function on the phase space. And well, you might want to build a collection of states which form a module for the for the quantum algebra of observables, which deforms the classical one. So, so you win if you can produce this, this, uh, these structures. You lose if you can't. Uh, and now, now create producing this uh, this algebra, this non-commutative algebra of observables is a you know a rich problem. Uh, might might be difficult, might be easy. Uh, I'm going to be in a situation, I'm going to think about a situation where this problem has been solved already. So suppose some, somebody has already handed me a very, some nice algebra of quantum observables and uh, even a module of states that you want to, uh, you want to build uh, with some hermeticity condition. Then um, in order to get a representation in a Hilbert space, you probably want this, for this module to be equipped with, a, with an inner product, uh, with a positive definite inner product. Now, in algebraic language, you can imagine that you have this module, you take the emission conjugate of this module, I denote it here as tau of m. And the condition of finding an inner product, uh, which is remission, is essentially the condition of finding a, a linear function on the tensor product of the module and its remission conjugate over the algebra. Now, in this, this, this last, last slide, we'll put h bar. From now on, I will just drop h bar. And well, uh, this is an algebraic problem in uh, the, the computing the tensor product of two modules. The tensor product might be empty. It might be one dimensional. It might have some dimensionality. If it's empty, then you just cannot define an inner product. If it's one dimensional, well, uh, you'll have a unique choice of inner product and it might or not be positive. So you either win or lose right away. If there is a finite dimensional or some you know, some space of possible tensor products, then you'll have a bootstrap problem in your hands. You'll have to 
find a specific choice of inner product which is positive definite, uh, some kind of semi-definite programming problem, definite problem. And I mentioned bootstrap because this whole story sort of started from the superconformal bootstrap of three-dimensional microfort theories. So there is a certain problem that uh, people encountered when trying to bootstrap the three-dimensional microfort theories, uh, which if you squint at it hard enough, looks like the problem of defining a quantum system given an algebra. And so, you know, I, I started thinking about this as, as a way to produce quantum systems. For example, uh, looking at the quantum system which emerge in 3D and four theories, you can recover a lot of, or study a lot of questions about classical representation theory. Um, now, you're surely very familiar with it. I mean, I, I use a perhaps slightly unfamiliar language here. Ah, sorry, point, I need to get used to it. Uh, but this, is an, this procedure is something you've done countless times during your career, for sure. Like when you study the harmonic oscillator, Okay, you can do it by solving a, a, a Schoenig equation. But a more entertaining way is to just write down, discover that there is a raising and lowering operator, that they have a nice form of nice wall algebra, and that you can find a state annihilated by the lowering operator. Then you get a whole module for this wall algebra by acting with a dagger. And uh, this module happens to have a unique tense in a product, so, which is positive, so you win. If you made a mistake of looking for a state which was annihilated by the, the creation operator, well, you would lose because you would immediately find that the, the norm of A0 is negative. Uh, similarly, when you study representation theory of Lie algebras, you know, you try to quantize your, you know, so study spherical harmonics on a sphere, again, you, you, uh, you take SL2, you, you look uh, for a representation where there is a lowest weight vector and build a, the module, look for an inner product, and so on. Uh, and this technology can be used in less familiar situations, like you can be unit representations of uh, SL2R, SL2C, other Lie algebras, uh, quantum groups. You can, there is a whole, there, are, there is quantum deformation, so this whole procedure that gives you, can be applied to quantum groups. Uh, in general, so the, the algebra part is uh, typically better understood than the positivity part. So uh, the study of unity representations of all of these objects is, is an old subject, but it's a subject which is still active. So there are definitely situations where you know very well the representations, but the, what, which, one, which one are unitary, it's a difficult question. Uh, typical method that you can use to study this problem is to find some representation which is unitary, and then try to deform the module of the algebra. And positivity is an open condition, so typically you remain unitary for a while, and then some null vector will appear, and you will lose positivity sometimes. But actually, sometimes you keep going, and the null vector disappears. So uh, it's, I mean, I hear from mathematicians that it's a difficult classification problem. Uh, for example, you know, for finite, unitary representation of finite W algebras, that's tricky. Um, and I think that uh, the methods I'm going to describe in the rest of the talk can, can really be helpful in, uh, in understanding these kind of problems better, or at least in providing some solutions to these problems. So I want to give a, uh, a way to build positive you know, modules or algebras which come equipped naturally with a positivity condition. From, uh, a problem with initial doesn't seem to have anything to do with quantization. Uh, okay. Now, let me give a, uh, an example which will occur uh, particularly often. So, suppose I have an algebra, uh, say defined over the reals for simplicity, but uh, not very important, uh, which has a positive twisted trace, which means that you have a, func a, a linear function on the algebra, which, satis uh, which satisfies a, a condition like that. So a, a trace will be something where trace of AB equals trace of BA. I'm gonna twist the condition by some automorphism rho, rho, rho square of the algebra. And I want to have a positivity condition that trace of rho AA is positive. 
Once I do that, this algebra, I can think about the algebra as a module, as a bimodule uh, over itself. So this algebra has a left and a right action of A. And I can use this in the product to make the algebra into a Hilbert space. So I get the unitary representation of A tensor, uh, its opposite. Essentially, so I, I act on some element C in the Hilbert space by A from the left and from B, as by B from the right. And it's easy to see that now the right action is remission conjugate to the, to the left action up to this twist by rho. So I represented the algebra A as normal operators on a Hilbert space. And then, of course, it's remission conjugates uh, as well. And this representation, this unitary representation is a funny feature. There is a vector which is uh, corresponding to the identity of the algebra, which satisfies the equation that the left and the right action have the same answer and gives you, generate the whole Hilbert space. I call this a spherical vector for in analogy with things that happen in uh, classical representation theory. Okay, so, well, what is this good for? What, uh, what does this quantize? Well, uh, it gives you a quantization of complex symplectic manifolds. So suppose you have a complex symplectic phase space and you treat it as a real manifold using the, say, the imaginary part, the real part of the symplectic form as a, as a symplectic form. Among all possible functions on this symplectic manifold, there are holomorphic functions. Uh, and there are also anti-homomorphic functions. These are both observables and the Poisson commute. Because the Poisson bracket, bracket sort of takes either true holomorphic derivatives or true anti-homomorphic derivatives. So uh, that means that when you quantize this, this, uh, this phase space, you, will, you, will try, you might try to get uh, some observables which represent the quantization of holomorphic functions. Presumably, as acting as normal operators. And then the Hermitian conjugates will give you a quantization of antilomorphic functions. So, uh, whenever you have a situation like this, which, where you have two copies of the algebra, one opposite to the other, you can think about it as a situation of these are holomorphic functions and these are antilomorphic functions in some uh, complex phase space. So, this Algebraic problem of having an algebra with a, tra with a positive trace gives me quantizations of a complex phase space with this, uh, with this sort of properties. Uh, the main challenge, in a sense, to start with is which twist to use to, to even begin. So I'm going to look for a twisted trace, but twisted by what? For example, suppose I take the while algebra. The while algebra has no trace. So if I just try, if I do not put any twist, I have to stop immediately. But uh, it does have a trace which is twisted by a reflection. And it turns out this trace is positive. And if you uh, put this trace, positive trace, into this machinery, uh, you end up with a complex harmonic oscillator. So you have x and p and then x bar and p bar acting on, uh, acting on a true normalizable function on c. And uh, uh, this state here uh, is the ground state of the harmonic oscillator, something like the Gaussian e to the minus absolute value of x squared. Um, and in general, in the examples I study, the row will emerge from a sort of bizarre uh, procedure where you look at a complex symplectic manifold as, as if it was an hyperkeller manifold and do something called an hyperkeller rotation. Uh, this can take an holomorphic function into an antilomorphic function, and then you conjugate it back to an holomorphic function. And you say, why, 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 why? Uh, I also ask myself why for quite a while. But uh, you can find explanations based on, on uh, Witten's uh, brain and, and uh, Gukov's brain quantization uh, ideas. OK, so why all of this? Sorry, uh, it was a sort of lengthy uh, introduction. Let me motiv motivate uh, why, do, why would I want to have these sort of structures. So I want to study. And someone's theory with a complex gauge group, meaning SL2C. Uh, there is a potential language confusion. Uh, in the last few years, we have studied a lot analytically continued Chen Samon's theory, uh, which is 
defined as a contour integral in the space of complex connections, sort of trying to ask as what happens if you take your standard Chen-Samuels calculations and sort of try to change the level to be not integer or something like that. But here I really want to do an integral over the whole space of complex connections. Uh, and I want to use this action, which is the imaginary part of the Chen-Samuels action for the homomorphic connection. Uh, the level in front can be any real number. Uh, what happens is that although the usual Chen-Samuels action is is quantized. If you look at the, comp at the Chen-Samuels action for a complex connection, the real part has a quantized coefficient, but the imaginary part is not quantized. So I'm, I'm not going to put any. I'm not going to include the real part in the discussion, but only the imaginary part. And so I have this uh, continuum level S. And I would like to define this theory as a topological field theory. So. Uh, a, uni, no, a well defined unitary topological field theory. Of course, the gauge group is non compact, so presumably there will be some thickness here and there. Maybe the partition function on some three manifolds will be inf infinite or something like that. But I, I want to really get something se physically sensible out of it. Um, this theory is historically has been studied for various reasons. One of the reasons is that if you look at SHUC, Chen Simon's theory, you decompose the connection into real and imaginary parts, it really, it, it's essentially the same as the action for three, first order action for 3D gravity in a Lorentzian de Sitter uh, setting. Not the same in the sense that some choices of complex connection don't look like a metric, uh, but it's still at least evocative. Uh, so perhaps quantizing as a true and some theory can be as step towards quantizing 3D gravity. Um, okay. So until what time do I have? Because uh, we started. Uh, hmm? Yes, yes, okay, okay. So 45 minutes, right? Yes, okay. Okay, so the phase space of Chen-Samon's theory, you might remember, is the space of, com of uh, flat connections because the equations of motion set the con the the field strength to be zero. Uh, complex and Simon's theory has a phase space, which is a space of complex flat connections seen as real manifold. Uh, the natural observables are Wilson lines, holomorphic Wilson lines. So you take the holomorphic connection, you do a part of the exponential along some curve, take the trace in some representation. And they have a natural quantization. So from just standard and Simon's theory, we, we have learned how to quantize Wilson lines. There is something called the Skein algebra, uh, which, um, you know, it's a collection of rules on what to do when you act with one line and then the other. So you'll say, okay, something is equal to that, something like this is perhaps rewritten as that plus, uh, uh, blah, 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 plus various ways of reconnecting uh, your representations and your curves. So they are precisely in the situation I was mentioning where I know the algebra of observables I want. I know that I want this algebra and, and another copy coming from antilomorphic with some lines. Um, and so if I could find a positive, some twist and a positive trace on the skin algebra, then I would get a little bit of space, which is an action of holomorphic and holomorphic with some lines, and well, it could be a good starting point. Now, it would not be enough to, to, call, to declare victory because, uh, I mean, first of all, I don't know if it exists, right, a priori. How do I know that there is a positive twisted trace on the skin algebra? But and even if I find it, I'm worried that it will give me a quantization on a specific space manifold, but then it will not behave well when I deform the space manifold or when I try to build the compute the answer to a path integral on a three manifold. Uh, bordered by a state. So at, for three-dimensional topological field theory, I want to be able to, give, given a ma three manifold with a certain boundary, to produce a state on the Hilbert space associated to the boundary. The state might be distributional if, if my theory is uh, you know, not, not very finite, but I want to be able to produce it. And it has to satisfy equations, which are roughly a you know, quantization of the conditions that if I bring a Wilson line in into this three manifold, I can deform it inside the three manifold. 
So mathematically, there is a scan module attached to three manifolds uh, for the scan algebra, and I want to realize this scan module in my Hilbert space, ultimately. Um, so luckily, I don't have to, so I could, it would totally be fun to take the scan algebra of some manifold, like a four-puncture sphere, and do a bootstrap problem to see if I can find a positive trace. But luckily, uh, I don't need to because there is a different construction that gives me positive traces on the scan algebra. And this requires me to introduce the notion of sure index. So the sure index was originally introduced as a way to, uh, as a specialization of the superconformal index. So every superconformal field theory has a Witten index of, uh, of the space of states on an NS3, which has nice properties, is invariant of all sorts of deformations. And uh, some specializations of the superconformal index, where some of the fugacities are set to special values, appear to have special properties. And the Schur index was one of the many possible fun specializations that one con the people considered. But a very nice feature of the Schur index is that it's actually defined for any quantum, supersymmetric quantum field theory. So conformal invariance is actually not needed. In a physical theory, it could be defined as counting quarter BPS local operators uh, with some spin fugacity and, uh, and a sign. But a slightly better way to think about it is that these are operators which survive the holomorphic topological twist of the theory. I will not be able to discuss what holomorphic topological twist means, but there is a manipulation you can do to the theory to produce a simplified theory, and the sure index counts the local operators in this simplified uh, theory. And it's useful because although the theory is not conformal, the holomorphic topological twist kind of is. So you can put uh, the holomorphic topologically twisted theory on the Hopf surface you heard about yesterday and uh, define the Schur index as a partition function. I will now make a, a strong assumption. I will assume that this configuration for the holomorphic twist can be lifted to a reflection positive supergravity ground for the original physical theory. So the holomorphic twist considerations will allow me to sort of get a lot of algebraic information about the Schur index, but it does not give me any access to positivity because the, the twisted theory is not unitary. So my conjecture is that the setting I'm studying can be lifted to the physical theory where positivity makes sense. Uh, I'm not sufficiently familiar with building super rigid supergravity grounds to prove this statement. I really would be very happy if somebody could prove it for me. For now, I'll just conjecture it. And the formula work, meaning that the localization formula for the Schur index are manifestly positive, but at least reasonably manifestly positive. But OK, this is a, an important conjectural step that is really the linchpin of the whole construction. Uh, now, the Schur index is a function of you know, a power series in this parameter Q, but it actually comes with a lot of cousins. So if you take, say, any line def BPS line defect in your theory, you can count the operators that live at the end of the line. If you take multiple line defects, you could count <coughs> local operators that live at the junctions between all of these lines. Um, so you get a whole bunch of power series in Q. They really depend not much on the choice of line defect as much on the choice of, choice of K theory class of the line defect. Let me not uh, uh, go into this, but let's just say that these line defects have a natural fusion and that uh, they define some kind of an algebra and that the Schur index only depends on, sort of behaves well under this uh, multiplication in this algebra. So let me draw some pictures. So here is a situation where I'm counting local operators at the end of a line. Here I'm counting local operators at the junction of two lines. Here I took the second line and I merged it with the first one. And there is this sort of algebraic structure on the K-theory classes, which allows me to write the index in the presence of two lines as the index in the presence of one line, which is the product of the two. Uh, I can also take a line and bring it all around. There is a small framing anomaly that appears uh, when the theory is not conformal. And so that 
if you start with L2 and you bring it all around, you might get an L2 prime. So there is a morphism I'll denote as rho squared, which tells you what happens when you rotate the line by 2 prime. And so you discover that the index, the sure index in the presence of lines is a twisted trace. So the index of AB is the same as the index of rho squared BA. And then you can rotate a line only by pi and identify to the line in the opposite direction. Uh, I call this map rho. And so I of rho AB tells you, counts the local operators which convert A into B. And uh, if you, now all of these calculations can be restated as calculations on S3 times S1. So for example, the index in, of the endpoints of a line by the state operator map are counted by partition function where there is, the line is placed along the S1 and at a point in S3. If I do the same for this, I get an S3 which now has two lines at antipodal points and wrapping the circle in opposite direction. And now the, the conjecture is that, reflect that if this can be lifted to the physical theory with some supergravity of the ground, there will be a positivity. So that IAB is a positive definite uh, pairing on the space of lines, at least as long as the parameter Q is real. So these are the basic uh, physical considerations which allow me to build the twisted trace after the Schur indices. And these Schur indices are computed by very explicit localization formula when you theorize Lagrangian. And there are also infrared formula which allow you to reconstruct them from the BPS particles of the theory. So they're ex extremely computable objects. It's very easy to check, well, not very easy, but it's possible to check all of these properties for various simple examples, such as cyber theory. Um, theory. Okay. Now, okay, so the Schur index gives me a positive trace, twisted trace on an algebra, which is this algebra of fusion of lines. It's called the K-theoretic Coulomb branch um, by mathematicians, also perhaps by phys some physicists. So this is the space of vacua of the four-dimensional theory compatified on a circle. So the, the four-dimensional theory has a space of vacua called the Coulomb branch, which has some dimensionality. Uh, perhaps I should draw something. Yes. So the 4D theory has a certain Coulomb branch. Uh, you know, think about the pictures you see in the written paper. And the 3D theory gains extra, va extra vacuum by expectation values sort of, of, uh, of line defects. So you get a, a torus vibration of, a, of the four dimensional Coulomb branch. But the, if, the, if you try to find functions on, in, this, in this complex structure, you don't have much luck because there are no functions on tori. But if you rotate the complex structure, uh, then, then this becomes an affine uh, and I find thing that locally looks like this star to the to twice the rank, but but you know, globally is complicated, and there are functions on this Ketteret uh, Coulomb branch, which are uh, wrapped line defects. So this is the this is the setting. And uh, so the Schur index is as a quantization of the K-theoretic Coulomb branch, which is a complex symplectic manifold, as a real manifold with imaginary part of the symplectic form. This is the full statement. Now, this is true for any, uh, any four-dimensional equal to theory, but we can specialize to the class S theories. These are theories which are obtained by wrapping a six-dimensional superconformal field theory uh, on a Riemann surface. These six-dimensional theories are labeled by, roughly by an ADE Lie algebra. And when you wrap it on a Riemann surface, you can add all sorts of co-dimension to defects to enrich your theory. Um, this produces a lot of the Lagrangian theories you know, and more. But crucially, the K-theoretic Coulomb branch 
is the space of flat connections on the, on, on the Riemann surface C. And so sure quantization of the classes theory gives you a quantization of the space of flat connections and potentially a quantization of complex chain Simon's theory. Even better, uh, the, mapping, the action of the mapping class group, the, the, you know, what happens to this quantization as you, as you modify the, the, rim, the underlying Riemann surface, surface uh, is controlled by the dualities of the four-dimensional unequal Schur theory and is a known invariant of the Schur index. So the quantization is automatically invariant and covariant under the action mapping class group. Uh, the mapping class group will act on the algebra, and so it will act on the Hilbert space uh, unitarily. And also, there is a general technology uh, of wrapping the 6D theorem three manifold, which can be used to give you states associated to, um, to three manifold. So you really get all the you know, all the ingredients that you want to define a three-dimensional topology of the theory. Um, this, uh, the Hilbert space that you get is equipped with this interesting structure where there is a, there is a special state coming from the identity which is intertwined by holomorphic and anti-holomorphic uh, uh, observables. So you might ask, what does it mean in the language of chen simons theory? Now, complex chen simons theory uh, with this specific action has a funny property. chen simons theory usually does not have topological boundary conditions unless something special happens. Uh, your typical boundary condition is the WCW boundary condition, which supports the Kral algebra. But in this theory, something special does happen. The holomorphic and anti-holomorphic levels are the same. And as a consequence, there, is a topo there are topological boundary conditions. So in particular, you can require the connection, you can define a, a boundary where you require the connection to be unitary. So you say, I have SL2C in my manifold, but I have EC2 on the boundary. This is a topological boundary. In a well-behaved topological field theory, it will define a boundary state for every space manifold. And I identify that with this state one, uh, which comes out of the quantization. Furthermore, the state that generates the whole Hilbert space by acting, by acting on it with, uh, with Wilson lines. You can take these Wilson lines and bring them to the boundary. So now you have this topological boundary decorated by boundary lines. Now, this should totally remind you of something like Turay Viro. Like in the Turay Viro model, you literally construct a 3D TFT from a topological boundary. You have a fusion category of lines, of boundary lines, and you build the Hilbert space by decorating we're looking at skeins, pretty much, of these, uh, of these boundary lines. Uh, so this is a kind of to arrive your con like construction. I could even say 3D loop quantum gravity construction, perhaps. Uh, but the unitary structure, I believe, is novel. So this inner product built out of the Schur index, I think, is the new ingredient uh, on top of this sort of, because, you know, the to arrive your model, in a sense, came from Ponzano Regge, which was a way to try to build quantum gravity. So uh, it's very natural to encounter something like that in complex chain Simon's theory. But um, right, it's not quite obvious how to get an inner product when your space of possible lines is infinite dimensional. And the Schur index provides one, one such choice. And uh, the construction also gives you naturally a sort of a novel form of complex quantum groups which will govern uh, this complex chain Simon's theory. Uh, pretty much because there is, you know, one, once there is a specific class S theory, uh, such that the K-theoretic Coulomb branch is the quantum group itself. So you can apply that, the, the theory to the quantum group and you get representations of quantum groups, you get representations of quantum groups. Okay. Um, now, I want to spend a slide to conf, conf, compare with uh, previous attempts to build the complex chain Simon's theory. So there are two main uh, ideas. So one, so the, the idea of using sort of the algebra of the skein algebra as a building block to build the quantization of complex chain Simon's theory is of course not new. And uh, actually in the context of the 3D correspondence, meaning uh, wrapping 6D, the 6D theorem 3D manifold 
it could become very concrete. Um, and it's completely, com it's absolutely compatible with that. So that, so there are already, there were already sort of general ideas on how to build a partition function on three manifolds, but not quite on how to produce the Hilbert space attached to surfaces. Uh, so these two approaches complement each other and they are compatible thanks to what are called the, this infrared formula I mentioned for the Schur index, uh, which are sort of adapted to the cluster technology which is used to define the 3D, 3D correspondence. Uh, another thing you might want to compare with is holomorphic quantization. So uh, this space of complex flat connection has a, so if you, if you allow yourself to pick a complex structure on the Riemann surface, then you can polarize your space of flat connections by splitting it into uh, holomorphic and anti-holomorphic parts. And you can think about having functions of AZ bar on which AZ acts as a differential operator. Now, the space of possible AZ bars is the space of bundles. And so you can try to build the Hilbert space as sort of wave functions on the space of bundles. More precisely, they are uh, twisted half densities on the space of bundles. Uh, this is very nice. It has you know, deep connections to two-dimensional conformal field theory. Uh, you can show that the choice of complex structure on the Riemann surface can be eliminated by, at least locally, with the help of the KZ equations. But it's kind of tricky to write, to, to make contact with three manifolds. Sorry. Ah, where did I go? Ah, oops. Oh, look. Okay, uh, sorry. It's kind of tricky to make contact with, uh, with three manifolds, uh, precisely because you put the Riemann surface, you know, complex structure on the Riemann surface and then evolving the Riemann surface into it complicated three manifold is difficult. But you can ask what's the relation between this and what I'm talking about. And uh, well, you can we have a conjecture that the state A I was discussing can be reproduced by a partition, the partition function of a WCW model on H3 plus on, on the complex group divided by the real group, uh, the compact group, decorated by the Linda lines. So this nice 2D CFT, although I'm doing it at the imaginary level, which is a little, little bit uh, unconventional. But conjecturally, the partition function of the CFT, so the CFT can be coupled to bundles, so it gives you a function on the space of bundles, and conjecturally, it gives you a normalizable half density on the space of bundles. Um, we haven't proved, proven this normalizable, but I would point a sort of a tantalizing connection with what you're seeing in, uh, in the case of Liville strings. So if you remember one of the talks earlier in the week, there was a statement that you could integrate level theory and imaginary values of the central charges on the space of complex structures, and it will be absolutely convergent. Here is something similar, but you're looking at this WCW theory, and you're integrating on the space of bundles. So I would like, definitely like to, to know if this integral is convergent and uh, if it really agrees with this Schur index. So conjecturally, this gives you sort of the, the iso an isometry that maps the show quantization into this Hilbert space. And then there is also the question if this is surjective. And I perhaps should mention briefly, uh, if you take a, an S to zero limit, so a very quantum limit, uh, you can make contact with analytic, analytic Langlands. So this <coughs> surjectivity hypothesis becomes the, the idea that uh, uh, there is a certain spectral decomposition of the of the space of uh, <coughs> model function have densities on bundles. Anyway, sorry, this is a digression. Okay, so very quantization. No, I, I want A to be normalizable. So one and all the states obtained from one are supposed to be normalizable. There's a priori if you have uh, this non-compact WCW model, if your bundle is such that uh, you have zero modes, then this, would, this thing will diverge. Absolutely, yes. So this is to check the this convergence. Is, uh, yes, it's not obvious. So I, I'm hoping it's convergent, but this is definitely a terrible object. In terms, of, I mean, I, I I hope that it will have some kind of square root square root like uh, integrable singularity. So this uh, the uh, wobbly locus in the space of bundles. 
because in the, I think in the analytical lens, it, it was marginally converging. Like you, uh, had, you had to just really uh, absolutely log of log of something. So, so. Yes, yes. So something like that. If, well, maybe here it'll be a bit, a bit better, but I'm not sure. Um, I mean, S presumably will affect the, the powers that, uh, that occur. Hmm? Uh, well, these are, see, these are, de these are half densities twisted by an imaginary power of K. Yes, exactly. The absolute value squared is density, so uh, you integrate it. So, uh, okay, so this was a story. I wanted to mention briefly some generalizations. Uh, if you, there is something called the sure half index, which you can compute if you have a boundary condition. This will count the operators where, that you find where a line ends at the boundary. And it has, you know, interesting properties too. It depends on the choice of bulk lines and, and boundary lines. Like I can have local operators, which is, oh, I should really do a picture for this. Uh, I can study local operators on a boundary which uh, are at, at the end of two lines, which interpolate between two boundary lines and also a collection of bulk lines. Okay, I don't know how to draw things which are not on the boundary. Okay. Um, and so the boundary lines form a module for the bulk lines and this half index behaves as a tensor product of two modules. Uh, and there is, now, now we need to assume that the, that the boundary condition admits a time reversal symmetry of some sort, I call it tau, uh, which you know, gives you a, an anti-automorphism of the algebra and maps the module to a, the left module to a right module so that I can and then I find myself exactly in the same situation as discussed at the very beginning. Uh, yes, where I have a module and I have a tau and I have tensor product of tau of tau m with m over a, and I need to find a positive definite linear product, a positive definite linear function on this uh, tensor product. And well, uh, conjecture. If you have this time reversal symmetry, the sure half index gives a positive definite linear product. And if so, then you can promote the modular boundary lines to a Hilbert space with an action of your bulk lines. What can you do with this? Well, complex Simon's theory can be defined on, on surfaces with boundaries, precisely because it has boundary conditions, topological boundary conditions. So you could study it on a disk, uh, on a cross cut, on a, on a, sorry, on a, on a real projective space, things like that. Uh, this will give you some real, con you know, you can think about a, Theory, a surface with boundaries of cross cups as uh, a quotient of a doubled up thing. You can write down the scan algebra on the doubled up surface and then impose reality condition to find the lines on your, on your surface, on, the, on your surface with boundaries. And uh, so the main challenge is to find an actual boundary condition in the class's theory, which will correspond to a surface with boundaries of cross cups. It, 3D, 3D, the 3D, 3D correspondence can be used for that. There, there are some, you know, it's not, you know, it's not algorithmic yet, but I think it can be algorithmic. Um, so if you can find the such a boundary condition, you get the quantization of this Gensamo's theory uh, in this setting. And as a test case, um, I, I want to discuss for a moment, if I can, uh, a weird duality. So people have been studying for a while or something called the SYK model. This is a quantum mechanical system which uh, uh, is built out of a bunch of uh, Majorana fermions with some random coefficients. You build an Hamiltonian with random coefficients with some specific uh, you know, covariance. And uh, it, it seems to be some kind of a dual to 2D gravity. And it, there is a certain scaling lim scale, double scaling limit. It gives you this thing called the double scale SYK model, which is a bit simpler. Um, it depends on this parameter Q. 
Now, if you just open a paper on the double scale SYK model and look at a formula in there, and you've seen some half indices, you will immediately see that these are half indices. So the co a lot of correlation functions look like half indices in cyber victim theory with normal boundary conditions. And so, well, uh, it's almost immediate to say, okay, this is complex and someone's theory. And you need to dig a bit hard, harder to find which surface is involved in the process. And it, it looks like Chen-Simons, complex Chen-Simons theory on a disk with one irregular puncture and this kind of SU2 boundary. Uh, it's, maybe it's an accident, okay? It's possible, it's just a coincidence. Uh, but maybe there is something, something more, okay? As a 2 c Chen-Simons is not the same as 3D gravity, but uh, it's really tantalizing. Okay, thank you. Um, usually when we connect uh, S-class N equals 2, D equals 4 theories to complex chain Simons, the, the kind of simple observables in N equals 2 theory, BPS observables, they map to holomorphic functions on the modular space of light connections. Are you saying that you can find general functions as uh, controllable by in your approach to the uh, quantization? Well, you can quantize holomorphic functions and anti-holomorphic functions. But what if then you, you can multiply take a product, them. Yes. And once you have them as operators, you can multiply them. They're normal operators. But they don't preserve the same supersymmetry, right? Uh, uh, in n equals 2 and d equals 4. So, good way to say it. So what's going on is that So imagine that this is sort of the equator of the S3. And here you have your line defects. But moving along the equator is kind of an hypercalar rotation. Uh, in the, in, if you go back to the Lomophic topological theory, where you have these lines, uh, if the theory is not conformal, especially, the Lomophic, top, anyway, the Lomophic topological twist uh, So you can take a, a, a supersymmetric line and make it a topological line in the homomorphic topological twist. But if you, if you rotate the line, you need to adjust which supersymmetries you are preserving. So this line and the same line with a different slope is actually preserving a different choice of supercharges. So effectively, this line and this line are preserving opposite choice, an opposite choice. So. The lines here, if the lines here are holomorphic functions, the lines here are anti-holomorphic functions. And then you sort of cut this picture and try to build a Hilbert space on which is both of these act. Yes, yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. When you said there's an infrared formula for the Schur index, you're, you're thinking of this uh, work you did with the Cordova and Shao, is that right? In terms uh, of the BPS? Yes, yes. The so trace of the conservative Soibelman Sob monodromy? Absolutely. So, so then is the positivity that you're conjecturing here related to the no exotics conjecture? Um, I think so. Right, because but, I mean, uh, if, the, uh, if, the, if the vacuum. It's not the, clear. The, the, the sign, the sign, actually, the, didn't we have some positivity con conjectures about those? Yes, but, okay, let me say. I'm, I'm wondering I if it's related to your positivity. So the, so I put this condition, Q square, between one, one and zero. As far as I know, both for positive Q and negative Q, you get a good Hilbert space. And our positivity would tell you that certain things are positive when Q was positive. Uh, in the sure index formula, the inner product between two things uh, sorry. would look like uh, in, the, in the first formula you get something like this. There is, there is something called the spectrum generator. Uh, then there are some things called uh, frame BPS degeneracies. And you sort of, uh, 
you can identify this as a state in, uh, in an auxiliary Hilbert space uh, associated to the abelian theory. Yes, and, well, and then to, the, to do this, you need to take the, the inner product. So you're going to do the, the inner product of f of, sort of f of a, s, f of b, s, inside this Hilbert space. And our positivity conjecture was this, the coefficients inside here are positive. It's not really relevant for the inner product. I think I didn't understand. Uh, so uh, are you saying there's a, a positive trace on the skate algebra? Is that what you're saying? Yes. Are you giving us a formula for that positive trace? Yes. What's the formula? Well, it depends on the surface. Okay, you, 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 you take your pick. The, the sure index uh, for the tier, classes theory associated to the surface. Is there a formula which you can write down for a mathematician, or is it a... If you say, oh, I want to use the four puncture sphere, or the one punction torus, I can write an integral formula. It's very, it's very straightforward, yes. I, actually, I have one more question. So you, you mentioned this connection to, um, to analytic lang lens. Yes. Uh, before you take the limit to analytic lang lens, yes. does it still make sense to contemplate Hecke operators? And unfortunately, Hecke operators are not, not there anymore. Uh, you can talk about Whittaker functional and Hecke modified Victor, Victor functional. So there are certain distributional states in the, in the Hilbert space. Uh, you could totally try to, say, to ask questions about the inner product between the Whittaker functional, maybe the, and, uh, and the states I'm, I'm, uh, I'm defining. This would be Liouville theory. Uh, uh, in the presence of some Verlinda lines. Um, it almost feels Again, this is not 3D gravity, but if I could pretend for a moment this is 3D gravity, there would be a feeling of uh, uh, DSCFT. So this is really the, the CFT at the cosmological boundary. And nice talk. So uh, maybe my question is also related to what Nikita was asking. So in the context of uh, n equal to two theories mm -hmm. in two dimensions, uh, the structure in which you have a topological theory and an anti-holomorphic version of it yes. get combined in the context of the TT star geometry, the vacuum geometry, and all that. So in the context of the 4D, uh, you could do the same thing, and people have done the TT star analog of the geometry in 4D, but the analog of that in 3D would be presumably is that related to what you're saying? Is there, is your uh, objects which are real functions uh, related to the vacuum geometries of the three theory in some form? So there is a 3D version of the story where you use 3D nickel for theories on S3. Uh, there are sort of two different compatifications on S3 that you can consider. Uh, and in one of them you put Higgs branch, and the other you put Coulomb branch uh, local operators on the equator. So this gives you quantization here, I called it, uh, of the Higgs branch or the Coulomb branch of the theory. Um, if you use the hemisphere, to a real version of the quantization, so that now you have some kind of module of boundary local operators. Then what's happening on the S2 is the S2 partition function studied by Gomis and collaborators, which is not quite the TT star, but it's related in a way. So uh, that's all I can say. What's the, hmm? what's the, the radius. The radius. Yes. Any more questions? Well, just two quick yes. supplements to, to questions that came. So on the one hand, concerning the question of normalizability of this integral over Bungie, which gives, uh, uh, well, the sure index or the representation of the sure index as integral over Bungie, we are currently developing some techniques for checking this normalizability. And second, concerning Vivek's question, yes, CFT does give a sort of deformed version of the Hecke operators away from the critical level.
Yes. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes. But they're, they're most natural placed. Uh, sorry, Wait, we're saying hacky or hitching? Sorry, I didn't. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right, so uh, in the Enigal four super mill Kapustin Witten sort of picture, uh, geometric Langland has to do with things concerning the boundary. And. Constructed an N equals two theory. I know, I know, sorry. But I would just want to say that, right, the toothed lines that you try to use at, at level zero just don't exist in the, in the uh, general level. But if you have some non pole boundary conditions, then you can put boundary uh, toothed lines, uh, which is what I was discussing here. Okay, I guess uh, no more. Thank you.